We're very pleased to be joined by Professor Paola Gambarotta of Rutgers University to talk about our new text, Irresistible Signs, the Genius of Language and the Italian National Identity. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. So it seems that the concept most central to your book is that of the genius of language, which you've described both as, and I quote, its stubborn and untranslatable core and as an all-engulfing cultural matrix. And in this description, we really get a sense of the awe inspired by the mysteries of language and its inner workings, um, which brings to mind Noam Chomsky in a quite similar awe at, in the 20th century at the way children acquire a language. And in fact, Chomsky's idea of a hidden organ regulating that process has a strangely Renaissance feel, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So what then have we actually learned about the mysteries of language in the last five centuries and what is still completely a mystery to us? Uh, first, let me clarify that the phrases that you have uh, quoted uh, really do not describe my understanding of the genius of language, but uh, they are rather my attempt uh, to uh, explain uh, how the genius of language was experienced by Renaissance scholars. So, what have we learned uh, about the genius of language? W what I have learned is actually, I. I learned not to underestimate its power and its resilience. And I think that the force of this notion actually derives from the fact that it appeals to um, our most intimate relation to language, our mother, uh, our feeling for the mother tongue. So our mother tongue is also an acquired language, but of course we perceive it as uh, actually our most intimate possessions as something that is spontaneous and belongs to us. So the ambivalence of this, of this concept lends, it, uh, lends itself to different political uses. For instance, uh, to describe the genius of language as, uh, um, as the effect, as the effect of physical factors, uh, geography, climate, race, inevitably or usually implies an idea of community that is uh, close, a community you know, that exists by, by nature. While this instead, descriptions of the genius of language as a function of uh, historically, specifically historical, historically uh, specific and uh, uh, of acquired rhetorical habits, projects an idea, an image of a nation that is open, that changes in time. At least to me, the mystery is really the persistence and the force of this perception today. So if I can continue on that thread for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, in your introduction, you quote the linguist Werner Hillen, um, who feels that linking nationalist debates to notions of the genius of language and provides more, quote, history of national stereotypes than of linguistic ideas. Um, but you seem rather interested in these national stereotypes mm -hmm. insofar as they can be of some historical use. So what value to the cultural historian can such stereotypes be? And at the same time, why might they be offensive to the linguist proper, such as Helen? Mm -hmm. I think that more than offensive, this kind of, of study or national stereotypes in general are just not productive or useful to their inquiries on language typology and so on. So they, they don't have, let's say, so a cognitive value for, for a linguist or in the opinion in the project of a, of a linguist. And as far as my interest goes, I would say that I, more than, uh, than interested in national stereotypes in themselves, I was, uh, I was interested in, in the ways in which descriptions of languages um, shape ideals and images of communities. And I made some example before, you know, communities open or close, organic or culturally constructed, for instance. Uh, perhaps in a somewhat naive understanding, my naive understanding of, of critical theory, I believe that by studying the origins and the formations, though, so the mechanisms of formation of, of uh, collective narratives or collective scripts, by doing this, this that, that this would allow us, me, uh, to, to handle them, to handle these collective narratives more freely, more independently, to adapt them, to bend them 
to, you know, who we want to become, who we want to be. Curiously enough, uh, in the course of my study, I discovered that national, the, the, the last bastion of, of national character uh, studies uh, is the discipline of uh, marketing. And so this idea of national uh, character is still uh, operative when it comes to gauge the uh, marketability of the same product in different, in, in different markets. And, and this is interesting because, in, so in a way... Right, somebody might say an Italian would never consume this yeah, product. But absolutely. a German might. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. and, so, and to think about uh, marketing strategies. And so in a way it was curious to me because uh, we've come full circle. Some scholars say that the modern, uh, the modern uh, national stereotypes or, or ethnic characteristics actually were, uh, were um, systematized, were established in uh, commercial papers, diplomatic commercial papers. A colleague of mine here, Chris mm -hmm. Brown, told me a few weeks ago that he finds Vico very frustrating to read in Italian because of Vico's prose mm -hmm. itself. Um, and in your book you cite many scholars um, who speak about French as a language best equipped for rationalist mm -hmm. enlightenment philosophy. Um, but French also was a language, and I think it was Condillac who said, could never have produced a Milton. Mm -hmm. um, so in Vico's epic, before, just before the massive influx of mostly French forestilismi um, to bolster the Italian scientific and philosophical language, um, was Vico's Italian capable? And I guess by capable I mean, would it have allowed him to be anything but an anti-rationalist thinker? Vico's language. There are so many theories about it, of course, and I must say that um, I like to think of it uh, of it as a choice, you know, as an intention, as a choice of Vico, especially as his attempt uh, to uh, create a language that would be uh, more apt or would adhere, actually, uh, to his style of thought, to both the content of his philosophy and also to the principles, or, uh, to the principles of his philosophy. And by principles, of course, we comment both principi, you know, both uh, principles and beginnings of, of a nation. I also think that, in a way, because he was, um, he was returning to the language of the beginnings, meaning that he was, his language mimicked the, uh, the features of a primitive Italian, the sublime tropes of Dante. Uh, Vico also thought that he was putting forward the model of expression that, that would shape the new beginning of a modern Italy after the decadence of the 17th century. So he was turning uh, himself from a professor of rhetoric into the new poet in his sense of poetry, you know, the new maker of, of Italian culture. So I'd ask then as a follow-up, um, mm -hmm. can we ever allow ourselves to be as deterministic as I just was in assessing mm -hmm. the constraints of a language on mm -mm. the production of literature or philosophy? You know, I, I believe in linguistic agency. I believe that individuals relate in a, to, to their languages in a creative uh, way. And actually, we experience this in our everyday conversation, you know, how people bend the language to their own uh, feelings, to their own uh, intentions. And also, you know, of course, I couldn't possibly be a literary scholar, a scholar you know, a literary critic, if I didn't believe in creativity in language. In fact, I, I even think that this is the friction uh, between, um, between what we want to say and the limits that our uh, languages impose on us that spur creativity. I'm curious about your decision to publish this work in English. Um, could it have mm -hmm. been written in Italian for an academic or casual Italian audience? Okay, I decided to write uh, to write and publish my book uh, here. Uh, um, first of all, because I wanted to enter uh, in, into a dialogue with an inter a broader international um, in intellectual community, let's say so. And unfortunately, Italian is not one of the 
languages of international scholarship. Um, at the same time, I thought this was my opportunity uh, to bring canonical Italian text uh, into the current debate on uh, language and politics. Because while I was reading uh, the, the most recent theories uh, of nationalism, I found too many uh, simplifications, too many really uh, reductivist um, interpretations of uh, the Italian path to nationhood. And I wanted to complicate, in a way, this, this picture. At least uh, by turning to a century previous to the one that people normally look at mm -hmm. in discussions of nationalism and language, which would be the 19th. Absolutely, absolutely. Speaking of monolingualism and turning away from the period covered in your book, uh, I'd like to ask about a contemporary issue. I think it's safe to say today that Italian, among other languages, um, is under the yoke of what you might call English linguistic imperialism, mm -hmm. um, which routinely seems to replace perfectly good Italian words with their, in my mind, less, ex less expressive English equivalents. Um, to say nothing of the situation which is quite precarious at this moment mm -hmm. of uh, regional and local dialects which are disappearing by the moment. Mm -hmm. um, is there a comparison to be made between this 21st, situa 21st century situation in Italy of increasing linguistic homogeneity and um, absorption of English words and uh, the debates on, the nationalism fueled debates on language and national character mm -hmm. in the period covered in your book? Of course, the dominance of English is a global fact. And this goes beyond the Italian uh, linguistic situation. And it is also a fact that the use of dialect is decreasing, especially its use outside the family, outside the household. So people actually, the 30% of people who use, who still use dialect, they use it only inside the household and they talk in regional Italian, I would say, uh, when uh, um, they talk in, in regional Italian uh, outside uh, the family. So these are two facts. At the same time, I, I wouldn't want to make the same arguments that uh, Pierpaolo Pasolini made uh, in, uh, in his articles, Le Nuove Questioni Linguistiche, 1960-64, actually published in, uh, in L'Unità, when he lamented the loss of the dialects and at the same time the loss of expressiveness uh, in the Italian language because of the dominance of the bureaucratese, of a kind of corporate, new corporate techno technocratic language. And this is because I believe that uh, we cannot speak about the loss of, of expressiveness. That, you know, there might be a new type of expressiveness, of expressive power, uh, which expresses values that we might not like, of course. Uh, but uh, as long as there is language there will always be uh, expressiveness. There will, so, there will also always be, as Jakobson would say, with his famous I like Ike, a poetic uh, function mm -hmm. of language. Well, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>